Welcome back. Today we're going to continue now. Now that you know how the tumor cell becomes malignant, we're going to see how it executes the various processes that do the destruction as the tumor progresses in the human body, the whole system of invasion and metastases, and another subject we call tumor angiogenesis. Remember these things. First of all, the cancer does exist before invasion as it's building up to that point where it's going to invade. Invasion has to occur before metastasis, and then the metastasis cannot occur before invasion, period. Now, invasion and metastasis are viewed as separate biological entities because they are, because the mechanisms are different. However, they are really linked in the biologic behavior in the body because it's the turning point in this disease that is metastasis. Metastases spread to organs that are going to kill the patient. Again, the primary is often in a place where it can do no particular harm except be locally painful or annoying or become infected. It's when it gets to the vital organs that the damage is done. Now, it has to gain access in most cases to a conduit, but there are other methods too. If you look at the first slide, there are three main ways that metastases can disseminate. The first is direct seeding, and that occurs primarily in ovarian cancers because the ovary is sitting there with the cancer on its surface. It can float off in the fluids of the abdominal cavity and land on the intestine, the abdominal lining, the peritoneum, or something called the omentum, which is an apron of fat. And it usually does this. This is the way ovarian cancers spread. Cancers in the pleural cavity float off the top of the lung and onto the surfaces of the chest wall. But most cancers have to go through invasion and spread that way. The first form would be lymphatic invasion in which they get into the circulation. And that occurs something like this. If you look at this as a vessel, it could be a lymphatic or it could be a blood vessel. In this case, they're showing a blood vessel. The primary tumor is sitting out here on the other side of some basement membrane. It has developed a blood supply of its own, which I'll tell you about at the conclusion of this lecture. And these transform cells break through and they get into a vessel. This is called intravasation, into a vessel. They then circulate and look at the way the cells the lymphocytes and the platelets clump the tumor cells together until they get big enough to get into a tumor cell jam somewhere, and then they extravasate, they exit the vessel and begin to form a metastatic tumor here, again, calling in their own blood supply. Now, this takes time. If we look at the circulation of the blood, what you can see here is if you have tumor cells out here in the body, anywhere, this could be breast, this could be, you know, tissue that could be almost anywhere in the body, in the systems of the body, it gets into the circulation. If it's on the venous side, it will circulate back to the heart because it's getting bigger and bigger vessels. Nothing's going to obstruct it. But if it goes through the heart, first it's going to go out to the lungs where the little vessels are going to get smaller and smaller till they're down to capillary size. And when they get smaller than whatever this is, they're going to clog it. A capillary is actually just a little bigger than a lymphocyte. It allows the passage of one or two cells at a time. So these little emboli of an embolism is something floating in the um, in the circulation. These little emboli of tumor cells are very likely to get stuck in the lung, and that's why the lung is such a frequent site of metastatic spread. Now, tumors in the lung can re-enter the circulation, and they can get back to the heart, and they won't meet an obstruction till they get out into the circulation again or in the brain, and those will be systemic uh, metastases, and I've actually seen, for example, a lung tumor growing in the gluteus maximus muscle, the buttocks, just from this kind of spread. Lymphatic spread is a little bit different. The, uh, as you remember, every cell of the body lies somewhere next to a lymphatic. That's how the tissues 
drain the fluid in the interstitial spaces so the tumor cell can intravasate into a lymphatic and then all the lymph nodes and lymph courses of the body move back upwards until they get to the neck. They will pass through lymph nodes, and it might be a good time to mention, we used to think lymph nodes were filters that blocked the progression of the tumor. It's not the case. Lymph nodes, if anything, are maybe a resting spot for the tumor. So the tumor will come in in what we call the afferent lymphatics, uh, which means toward the lymph node. They'll stay here for a while, growing or not growing, and then they'll enter the efferent lymphatics and move away, and we'll find ourselves back in the lymphatic circulation. This can happen as quickly as 20 minutes after arrival in a lymph node. And right up here in the neck, see that area? Up there is where all our lymphatics end in two big veins. These are the subclavian veins of the neck. And as you can see here, they join right where the jugular joins the subclavian and they empty into the bloodstream again. So what's going to happen to that group of cells? Here, they, here are the lymphatics coming from the body, going into the now the superior vena cava and dumping into the left side of the heart and the lymphatic dissemination is going to end up in the lungs again. That's why it's so common. With one big exception, and that is the blood supply to the entire intestine, stomach, colon, small bowel, all go through a separate set of veins into something called the hepatic portal vein, the portal to the liver. And there is a venous to venous capillary bed that gets small inside the liver. And the portal vein will deliver these tumor cells to the liver capillary bed. And that's why colon cancers, as you can see here, so frequently end up as a liver metastasis. Okay, that's the process of metastases and uh, invasion. And we find that also these metastases don't always end up where there's the most blood flow. You would think organs with the greatest amount of blood flow would have the most metastases. It's not always true. For example, the ovary has an abnormal amount of metastases because uh, it only gets about a fraction of 1% of the total blood flow of the body, but it has estrogen and other growth factors. So breast cancers end up metastasizing to the ovary. They may go everywhere in the body and only a fraction of metastases actually survive the trip. But those that do grow and the soil is fertile, for example, for breast cancer and stomach cancer to grow in the ovary, a common place to find it. So various organs like the lung and um, like the ovary and other places have some group of growth factors or fertility factors for the particular tumor and they tend to get tumors in one place or another where they're very happy to grow. So how do they do this? Uh, basically, what they have to do is they have to walk out. You, you uh, saw how they have to get into the vessel, how they have to get out through the basement membrane and get here. How do they get here? What they do is they have now developed mutations that have some extraordinary function. They are attached to the basement membrane by what are called laminin and laminin receptors. These are molecules that hold them against there so they don't go floating off. One of the things they do is they have to first break down the basement membrane, which they do by secreting substances called proteases, specifically one called collagenase 4, and that breaks down the main component of the basement membrane. Now, how are they gonna get out of there? How are they gonna walk? Well, they have an extraordinary way of doing this. It's called chemotaxis. It's a chemical way of walking. What they do is they have mutations that allow them to release themselves right there from the receptors. Then they do kedging. I don't know how many of you sail or know what kedging is. In the old days of sailing, when a great sailing vessel became becalmed, and there was no wind, they would put a bunch of sailors in a big rowboat and they'd put the anchor in the rowboat and these guys would row the anchor out 100 or 200 yards. They would drop the anchor there 
and the guys on the big vessel would pull and winch the boat to the anchor. And then they would pull up the anchor, row it out again, drop it, and pull themselves. That's what these guys do. These guys have receptors, and I showed you those cytokines much earlier in the course, that attract and make these uh, make themselves move. They secrete their own attracting uh, cytokines and they move toward that. Then they release from the rear, they secrete some more and they move. And they can physically move even though they're not what we call motile cells, even though they're not like the sperm cell or certain of the bacteria we saw that can actually swim. They can use this, um, this cell molecular movement to move out through the tissues. It's really quite fascinating how they do this. Um, this process takes place probably every day in every cancer patient, but very, very few of these cells actually go on to live. If you sample the blood and the lymphatics of cancer patients randomly for experimental purposes, you will find viable cancer cells in most of them. But most people don't have metastases, about half do across the board. And the problem is that about 30% of malignant tumors actually have metastasized by the time we see the patient for the first time. And of those, a good percent have hidden metastases that we can't see. So eventually, in the average cancer, and there's great variation, but in the average cancer, there's probably about half to, <clears throat> excuse me, two-thirds of the population that we can't cure by conventional means because they've already metastasized. Many of them are hidden. We call those occult metastases, so it makes it difficult to know how aggressive to be. We also know that metastases are multiple. They tend to shower off in, in great spurts of several hundred or a thousand at a time, and so they tend to seed in different areas. And those metastases can send off more metastases. We never were sure of that until a few years ago when we could tag these cells and see. We didn't know whether only the primary could send metastases, but now it's thought that even the metastases can further metastasize. Um, also, we know that um, there's something called biologic predeterminism. We believe that the tumor is inherently very aggressive or not aggressive at the outset. So we see patients with, for example, in breast cancer, very small tumors that you would think we could, we have discovered early and that we could cure early, and yet they already have metastases. We see other patients with relatively enormous tumors, you know, like that, uh, in the case of breast cancer, that don't metastasize or, and don't metastasize for a long time, that have been neglected, so there's something in the inherent, in, inherent in the first of the gene mutations that makes this an aggressive tumor. However, over time, tumors tend to become more aggressive because there is natural selection. They're competing for space, nutrition, and blood supply, and the most aggressive of the clone of that first cell tend to survive at the expense of the others, and they tend to metastasize more aggressively, the others die, or we may be able to destroy them. And then we end up, if we go too long, to have a very aggressive and nasty clone of tumors to deal with. And the mathematics are enormous. It takes a, a cell, a group of cells, about 125th of a cubic centimeter um, to be able to metastasize. So this is long before we've actually seen or been able to diagnose the, um, the tumor in the patient. I want to move on to another subject that's really a, a favorite subject of mine called tumor angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the development of new vessels. We do this all the time. Our body has mechanisms to make new vessels based on the need, first of all, during uh, embryo stages when we're developing early, early on. We make new vessels like crazy as the body is growing. And then every time we have an injury, we have to heal that injury, we make new vessels. This is also called neovascularization, new vessels, very, very common, normal process. Tumors have taken advantage of this. About 100 years ago, 
anatomists and surgeons saw with the naked eye that tumors had an extraordinary number of abnormal vessels growing into them, malignant tumors. Uh, this does not happen in benign tumors, but they noticed that the blood supply was huge. It often hampered surgery because it made it very bloody. And they also noticed if there was an absence of vascularity, they had something called tumor necrosis. The tumor seemed to be dying on the inside. And then Judah Folkman, a name you really ought to remember if you want to look further into this. About 30 years ago, Judah Folkman told any of us who would listen that he didn't believe that we needed necessarily to get all the cancer out of patients' bodies. And we all sat up and he said, after all, we don't cure heart disease. We treat it. We n almost never cure diabetes. We treat it. We make it possible for the patient to live with it. Why do we think we have to get really destructive and cure cancer. And Judah's a very bright man. He's now the chief of surgery and has been chief of surgery at Children's Hospital in Boston. And he started there when he was about 34 years old. A uh, brilliant researcher, surgeon, and investigator, and a, and a fine physician. So Judah pointed out to us that tumors grow to the size of about two to three millimeters, you know, the big, big dot on a page. And then they stop. And if you implant tumor cells in the cornea of a rabbit, which is avascular, the cornea has no blood supply, and watch it, you will see it grow. It'll stop at two to three millimeters, and then blood supply will start growing in from all sides symmetrically. And as soon as the blood capillaries touch the tumor, bango, exponential growth. And if you stop the blood supply, intervene, the tumor goes away and shrivels up. So Judah said, well, maybe, maybe we should be thinking about stopping the ingrowth of the vessels and nobody's going to die from a metastasis that's only that big. And he began investigating and discovered that there was something he initially thought was called tumor, he called tumor angiogenesis factor, thinking it was just one. But as his experiments went on and others joined in this uh, search, they found here a bunch of angiogenic molecules and there are probably more than these, but the ones that are very popular now because we know of their effects. One is vascular endothelial growth factor called VEGF, probably the most powerful one. And this, if you remember those, I've shown you lots of slides where the blood vessels are lined with one layer, here we are, of cells. Here's a blood vessel line. Those are vascular endothelial cells. And what this does is it allows them to push out, almost like an invading cancer, out of its place and, and begin to replicate trying to form blood vessels. It's not a malignant process. It's a benign process. It doesn't metastasize, but it makes vessels. And the VEGF is one of the most powerful of them all. There are others. Fibroblast growth factor, both acidic and basic angiogenin. I want you to just know these terms and you'll hear them again. And then transforming growth factors alpha and beta. Tumor necrosis factor you've heard about already. And then there's something called PDECGF, uh, platelet-derived endothelial growth factor. Remember the platelets. All these are produced by the primary tumor and they all call in um, small capillary vessels to the tumor. In the inflammatory process, it would, the inflammation and the, and the tissue involved would never heal without these factors. So you find them there. Interesting thing is that these factors are the same in all solid tumors. There's no difference in them. Leukemic cells don't have this problem. Because if you take this, for example, here's, let's say this were a malignant lymphocyte, as you get in leukemia, he's already bathed in blood. This one doesn't need to get blood vessels. It's riding around in blood. So leukemia, some of the lymphoma cells, um, many cells that are in a liquid medium don't really need tumor angiogenesis factor. Something like that ovarian metastasis, we've seen them implant, and then they won't do any growing if you look at them through a, a peritoneoscope, a laparoscope, until you see the vessels come in, and then they mushroom. So the beauty of this and the thrilling part of uh, Dr. Folkman's discovery is that if we could interfere with tumor angiogenesis, we wouldn't need a different one for every tumor. We use different chemicals for different tumors in chemotherapy.
we would, if we wanted to use a vaccine, which haven't been very successful, we would have to use a different vaccine. Here, if this really works, then we only need one. We can treat everybody the same. Now, these vessels are very abnormal. These tumors don't get beautifully formed vessels. Um, this is what the normal development of vessels looks like. The tumor vessels grow higgledy-piggledy. They have veins going to veins that shouldn't be, arterioles, arterioles going directly to uh, venules, which shouldn't happen without capillaries, but they do the job. The other interesting part of this cycle is that we used to say when we see, see a tumor with a necrotic center, we'd see a big tumor, and if we opened it inside, it would just be all jelly and dead cells. And we all said, ah, the tumor has outgrown its blood supply. And that logically is wrong. If it doesn't have a blood supply, it's not going to grow. What we found was tumors all make these angiogenic vessels, but they don't make lymphatics. Now remember, those lymphatics are taking the fluid out of the center between the cells and moving it back into the bloodstream, that interstitial fluid. So what's happening, you have a big tumor growing, and you have it in a confined space. The outside of the tumor is getting a blood supply, but the inside is getting pressure buildup of fluid. It's actually getting pressure necrosis because it doesn't have any lymphatics. It's abnormal tissue. And that absence makes the center of the tumor die while the outside continues to grow. So Dr. Folkman and his researchers, he has a fantastic lab, and I might add, I'm proud to say he's a surgeon who's doing all this intellectual, careful research and not a medical guy. He started looking for angiogenic inhibitors, and he found, and his laboratory assistants and other laboratories also found these inhibitors down-regulate here, the interferon alpha, down-regulates basic fibroblast growth factor, thrombospondin, which is another chemical involved in the clotting mechanism, is an antagonizer. And then angiostatin, which is named just to mean stopper of angiogenesis, is a fragment of a larger molecule called plasminogen. Plasminogen is part of the clotting cycles. And lots of these anti-angiogenic molecules are also fragments of larger molecules. It's the body's way of hiding chemicals we might need, and we don't want them activated right now, for use at a later time. And that fragment then splits off when needed to do its job. It's the way the enzymes, for example, that digest meat sit inside the pancreas and don't digest your pancreas because they're inactive. We put them out into the intestine where the pH changes, they become active. So the angiogenic inhibitors seem to do the same thing. Next thing that came up was uh, an observation that people made. It was made for a long time. We said, you know, they opened up my grandmother and the tumor just spread everywhere like wildfire and, and she died. And the surgeons got another one of the many bad raps we got that surgeons are interfering with what's going on here. We're handling the tumors and we're spreading them and maybe it's a bad idea to, um, to handle these. It was a true observation. We found that after surgery for the removal of tumors, we did see a, lot, a certain number of patients who, who had metastases appear that we didn't know were there before. They obviously were there because otherwise, uh, if we've taken out the whole tumor, there was no new place for them to come from, but we couldn't see them. Now, all of a sudden, they got big. Why did they get big? Well, the obvious answer was the surgeon did it. So we developed things called tumor asepsis where we would go in and to take out a colon cancer. If we, for example, um, were operating on someone who had a cancer of this part of the colon, we would go in and the first thing we would do would be we'd clip that vein before we even touched it. And we would, before we even touched the cancer, so that cells couldn't ride up there and get away. We would then clip the artery and all the lymphatics. And then we would cut off the colon far from the cancer and try not to even touch the tumor so we didn't milk cells in. It didn't change anything. That tumor, so-called tumor asepsis, was absolutely useless. So Dr. Folkman and one of his other surgical residents, Dr. Riley, 
started looking at the mechanisms of what was going on in experimental animals and confirming it. And what they found was that there is a balance in positive angiogenic factors and then those negative or an anti-angiogenic factors or angiogenic inhibitors. Here's the primary tumor. This is putting out both inhibitors and positive factors for growth. But in the case of the primary, the tumor is putting out many more angiogenic factors biologically because it needs them. It doesn't want such a balance. It wants to grow. And it's overwhelming its own system and overwhelming the inhibitors uh, so that the primary is growing. And the reason the little metastasis is not growing, this is not visible to us, is the half-life in the circulation. We talk about chemicals having a half-life. The half-life of the positive factors is very short. They don't get out to the metastasis in any great concentration. The angiogenic inhibitors have a very long half-life, relatively. They are going out there and they're upsetting the balance out here in the metastatic area. Now, this little metastasis has the same relative balance that the primary has. It has angiogenic factors and inhibitors in a proportion to let itself grow, but it's being kept in check by this long-lived excess of inhibitors. So now the surgeon comes in very carefully using aseptic technique, takes out this tumor, doesn't handle it, and the met metastasis goes crazy, gets big. What's happened? We have removed all the sources now for both inhibitors and angiogenic factors from the primary, and now this is behaving like a primary. It's got that unbalanced leaning toward the angiogenic, positive angiogenic factors, and it begins to grow wildly. So the question then came up from non-surgeons, of course, should we not operate on these patients or should we just leave the primaries in? And the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is that we know that the oldest clones in the body are in the primary, right? They've had to have been there first. They are going to be the source of more and more aggressive tumor cells than anywhere else. So you really need to get that out. The primary also will have the biggest angiogenic uh, supply, and the angiogenic vessels are very good place for tumor cells to get into. So angiogenesis permits, although it doesn't guarantee, tumor metastases. So we really don't want to leave that behind. We have to put up with the growth of the metastases and we have to deal with it some other way. Um, so the answer is definitely no. We really want to stop the shedding. We still have to go after the primary. We still obey principles of tumor asepsis. It's hard to talk against it. It's like you know, motherhood and apple pie. It's a good thing not to manipulate tumors. It's a good thing to clip the veins and not allow cells to be manipulated. But we may do very little by using that technique, but there's no harm. So there's a whole field now of emerging anti-angiogenesis therapy, and it should be universally applicable to all tumors. Well, trials have begun, except for leukemias, of course, Trials have begun, and what they're doing is giving angiogenic inhibitors. Now, there's a, there's a hitch to this. There's a catch-22, or P53. Um, in, these, in these angiogenic inhibitors, we have a problem. They are tumor cell static, not tumor cell cidal. I talked to you earlier about bactericidal drugs and bacteriostatic drugs. Remember, penicillin stopped division, and before it, the, the cell had to divide before it died. If you have a drug that you're going to give that's back, t uh, sorry, tumor static, you have to give it for the rest of the patient's life. Now, there are almost happily no side effects to this. This has been a wonderfully non-toxic treatment compared to, let's say, interleukins or interferons, which are very toxic. The anti-angiogenic molecules are very, very benign and don't cause the patient much problem. They're very, very expensive at the moment. So this is, as I said, an anti, a, a tumor static mechanism. You've got to combine it with something else. And as you'll see in our next 
lecture, chemotherapy loves to work in areas with very few cells. So this is almost just made in heaven. You combine chemotherapy, which needs small tumor loads, with anti-angiogenesis uh, chemicals, and they work beautifully together. They're in clinical trials. They're in some clinical use. And I think this is a great, great field for the future because it'll be a very non-toxic treatment applicable to large numbers of patients. Uh, and we're hoping that this will really give us great results compared to the more barbaric ways that I'm going to tell you about in the next lecture.